Astronomy Cast, episode 289 for Monday, January 14th, 2013. Cherenkov Radiation. Welcome to Astronomy Cast, our weekly facts based journey through the cosmos where we help you understand not only what we know, but how we know what we know. My name is Fraser Kane. I'm the publisher of Universe Today, and with me is Dr. Pamela Gay, a professor at Southern Illinois University, Edwardsville. Hey, Pamela, how are you doing? I, I'm doing well, and I love that this is the one and only time I can pronounce something that you mispronounce. Sh- sh- you can do Russian, Sharenkov. <laughs> how, how do you say Sharenkov. it? Sharenkov. See, I, I had it in me. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, in, case, in case Preston wants to reuse this, Astronomy Cast, episode 289 for Monday, January 14th, 2013, <laughs> Sharenkov radiation. For, so, um, well, thank you very much. I'm, I'm really glad you were able to uh, bring your Russian it's training. It's the only time. I know. I know you've got, you, you learned Russian for this, all your training for this very moment. Um, so, we're going to... Uh, we're going to be at Science Online. I guess by the time you receive this, we will have already been at Science Online, which was a really cool conference in uh, North Carolina. So that's sort of, and that's going to cause a little bit of weirdness. And we're going to try and record some shows live while we're there, at least hang out from a restaurant or something and, and do a couple of episodes to catch up. There's also been a whole bunch of catch up episodes coming into the feed now. I, I, I hope you've all been noticing. We apologize for episode 283. Yes. We lost the audio. If you want uh, to know how to most effectively destroy a Macintosh with iPhoto streams, I Google plus the death of my computer. Nice. <laughs> like you like you broadcast its death or you, you no, Google no, it to No, no. I, I, ra- I, I rage posted against the machine. Okay. <laughs> and it rage quit. So, um, right, so we apologize. Now, fortunately, we had our backup, which was the uh, YouTube video, so we were able to extract the audio from there, but that's, so that's what you're hearing. And, uh, and the other thing is, I hope you have noticed, we've got the Weekly Space Hangout coming back into the feed, and that's fantastic, which, is, uh, which was the show, the weekly hangout of all of the space and astronomy journalists. So and, and we really have major kudos for noisy astronomer Nicole Gallucci for being the force of nature behind herding the cats to make that happen. That is what threw me off the rails in the first place, and, and it's, I'm really glad that Nicole's uh, stepped up, so that's fantastic. All right, well, let's get, uh, let's get on with this. So, <clears throat> so, sure, our atmosphere protects us from a horrible universe that's trying to kill us, but sometimes it prevents us from learning stuff, too. Case in point, the atmosphere blocks highly energetic particles from reaching our detectors. But there's a way astronomers can still detect their influence, Sharenkov radiation. The cascade of radiation that blasts out as high-energy particles make their way through the atmosphere, like a radioactive rain shower. Uh, so Pamela, let's let's go like first science. Science. So what is what is Cherenkov radiation? It it's radiation that is generated when a particle uh, passes through a medium at faster than the speed of light in that medium, which is just a really interesting thing to try and wrap your head around. And as the particle goes through at faster than the speed of light in that medium, uh, it it causes all of the particles around it depending on what they're made of. This is specific to dielectric materials um, to to get aligned and then when they collapse back down to their normal um, state of chaos they give off photons that are organized and and we are able to see the distribution of this color of light um, and detect it and what's really awesome is as you have this particle barreling through some material. And it doesn't have to be just our atmosphere. This can happen with a neutrino passing through special fluids. Uh, This is how we detect uh, neutrinos as well. The the shock wave created by its motion through the medium will create a beautiful ring of of light. And depending on the crispness of the edges of that light, it tells us a lot about what was traveling through the medium. Now I'm going to need you to back up for one second, and I you said, you would. Yeah, you said <laughs> and and you said that when something moves faster than the speed of light through the medium, through the medium. So, so can you go back and and because I mean obviously Einstein would not appreciate something moving faster than the speed of light in vacuum. In vacuum, no, I understand. So what so what exactly is going on here? So we've got this particle moving you know, like like a cosmic ray or something, right? And it's moving through space. 
through in a vacuum very quickly. Quite happily. And then it hits quite happily, and then it hits the atmosphere. And breaks. And what does it do? So because it can't, like it can't go faster than well, the speed of light. Well, no, no, no. So, so that's the crazy thing: is particles can quite happily go faster than the speed of light through a medium. There, there's actually rubidium gas that you can, in a fancy setup, make light travel at about human walking speed. <laughs> that's kind right. of so awesome. So you could, you could, so you could send a pulse of light one side through the rubidium, run around to the other side, and catch it on the other side before it. It's hard makes to catch light, but yes. Yeah. And 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 so so because the propagation speed of of the phase of the wavelength through the medium is so slow in some cases you can actually if I wanted to be in the rubidium gas I could walk faster than the the particle of light through the gas that's cool yeah now in in everyday reality uh, light traveling through our atmosphere travels slower than it does when it passes through a vacuum. And in fact, a particle traveling at relativistic speeds, or even at the speed of light in the case of gamma rays, through vacuum, when it starts passing through our atmosphere, um, it, it starts undergoing braking processes, but, but it also, these are energetic particles, these, these are charged particles. And, and that charge um, influences the, the area around them. Moving charged particles uh, generate electric and magnetic field effects and there's a bunch of different types of materials. We normally talk about uh, conductors, so the wires in your walls conduct electricity, they conduct telephone signals, they conduct lots of different things. Um, and then we talk about insulators, so the wood of my desk is not going to allow a random sparking something to electrocute me. Um, so we, we, the plastic coating the wires in your house is going to protect you from getting electrocuted. But in between the conductors and the, the insulators is, is what's called dielectric material. This is material that doesn't so much transmit the electricity, but unlike an insulator which just doesn't care about the electromagnetic fields, a dielectric material is actually going to have all of its little charges happily flip to, to coordinate. They're going to polarize. And, and this is how they respond to the charge. Now, it's a higher energy state to have all the particles flip and line up. Normally, they're nice and chaotic and everything balances out to neutral. So when you have this high-speed charged particle moving through, it, it causes all of the, the stuff in the dielectric material to, to line up. And, and that happens even when it's going slow. But what's awesome is when it's going really fast, the re-emission of, of the energy from the lining up of all of those particles in the dielectric is is coordinated and you get the shrink off radiation got it okay all right so then what kinds of of events what kinds of particles stuff is going to be causing these this this radiation so there's there's various different types of places that we observe this. So with air detectors, detectors out in the open, often up at big observatories and tops of mountains, uh, you are looking for the cascades of light created by cosmic rays entering our atmosphere, gamma rays entering our atmosphere and interacting with the atmosphere. In underwater situations, you're looking for neutrinos, you're looking for muons. And so, like, a, I mean, we did a whole show on cosmic rays and neutrinos mm -hmm. and stuff, but just a quick, you know, the difference between a, ga a gamma ray and a cosmic ray, I mean, they sound like they're the same thing, but they're... So they're a gamma right? ray is, is actually just a photon, a very energetic photon, a very, very, we don't have a word for higher energy light than this. So gamma rays are just particles of light that, that are extraordinarily high energy. And, and then cosmic rays, they, they can actually be particles. Uh, so this isn't a photon. This is something that has mass and is traveling at relativistic speed. So it's not actually going at the speed of light, but it's going fast. Right. And, and they're often generated in things like supernova explosions or high energy jets in, in a variety of different um, things like uh, jets coming off of AGU, for instance, um, AGN. AGN, active galactic nuclei. Yeah. Um, and, and so when these high energy charged particles hit our atmosphere, they start breaking. Um, but 
they also, while they're moving so fast, cause this coordinated emission of radiation that we detect as strikeoff radiation. But I think the big key here is that they are the most energetic events that we see in the universe. I mean, yes. it's this, it's, it's, it's the same thing with the X-rays, with the gamma rays, with the cosmic rays. They're, you know, by every measurement, you're, you're at 11 with them, um, <laughs> right? <laughs> and, so, yes. and so normally, and this is, you know, if we didn't have our atmosphere, these events would be killing us with yes. radiation in quick. So, so yeah. thanks, atmosphere. <laughs> but, you know, <laughs> and, but we need and, spacecraft to, to view them. Right. And, and what, yeah. And, and even with spacecraft, we can't, we can't detect the shrink of radiation that comes from things like uh, neutrinos passing through the various heavy water detectors we have on the surface of the planet. So shrink of radiation is one of those amazing things that can be used uh, both in astrophysics, in particle physics, and in a variety of other subjects that, that are beyond what we can talk about in just these 30 minutes. And so to just focus in on those two different applications, Shrinkoff radiation, that's, that's how the Super Kamiokande reactor in Japan is able to detract, detect neutrinos from our sun, neutrinos being emitted in a variety of nuclear reactors. And what's really actually kind of awesome, in, to me at least, is it can differentiate between the different types of neutrinos based on how crisp the donuts of emitted light are as, as these neutrinos um, create the Shrenkov radiation. With, with a muon neutrino, it creates this beautiful crisp donut of, of light that can get detected, whereas an electron neutrino, um, because it creates multiple propagating cones where, where it triggers things that trigger things that trigger things, that creates fuzzy donuts of light. Um, and, and so just looking at the type of radiation that's created starts to tell us a story of what created it. So this isn't just a way to detect high energy stuff, it's a way to detect and differentiate between different types of high energy stuff. So then what will a, you know, there are a few uh, Sherenkov radiation detector facilities set up around the, around the world, right? There's the, what, the Pierre there's Auger. the Pierre Aguerre Observatory. Uh, that, that's only one of many different types. It, it's actually a really weird hybrid facility. Um, it, it's located uh, down in, in the Andes Mountains, and they, they use a variety of different detectors that uh, look for fluorescing materials that uh, are specifically detecting muons, that they're trying to figure out how can we detect this in radio waves. Um, so it's a, it's a kind of neat R&D facility that's looking for a variety of different types of events. More classically, people have used what are called air Shrenkov detectors. Uh, Whipple Telescope was one of these, and, and it's one of the neatest looking uh, telescopes. It's, it's this outdoor, fully exposed facility that has a million, it's not literally a million, but a bunch of little tiny um, mirrors that are all mostly lined up with one another. What's awesome about trying to detect this is you don't need to have a perfect surface. Uh, you're just trying to detect the full um, blob of light propagating through our atmosphere. And, and so you don't need to focus it or anything. So they have these big outdoor light collecting surfaces made of multiple mirrors that focus the light up to detectors that look at the distribution of wavelengths of light. And by looking at all the different colors that are getting detected and all the different timings of the detection um, and, and how the mirror is getting hit, they're able to figure out where on the sky this new cascade is coming from um, and tell various characteristics about it. So you can see, well, the cascades that are caused by gamma ray bursts, the cascades that are related to various other events. And it's, it's just kind of neat that there's a future for the badly focused telescope, and it's called detecting high energy particles. And so you've got all these different detectors set up across the landscape. And then as you mentioned, you know, you've got these cones of, of radiation coming down, and these detectors are then letting them kind of back you know, backtrack where the event <laughs> right. came from, right? Exactly. Yeah. 
And, and one of the kind of frustrations with a lot of these detectors is you have this event that takes place high, high up in the atmosphere that, that causes secondary particles to get generated, that, that cause the shrink off light to be generated by all these different cascading particles. So you end up with a lot of these little different cones when you're using the air detectors and all of these different cones from all of these different reactions end up creating this vast, it's often referred to as a pool of, of light in the atmosphere that then only part of this pool is getting captured by the air detector, the air Shrenkov detector like Whipple. And, and so it's, it's a much less precise science when you compare it to say um, the, the vast array of photomultiplier tubes that are used to very precisely look at the, the donuts of light coming out of a single particle reaction within one of the super Kamiokande um, tanks. And, and so when you're looking at, at atmospheric things, um, it, it's just a mess, but it's a mess that we can turn into science. And then when we're looking at single particles in the, the swimming pool detectors, essentially, we have these beautiful, precise reactions of particles that in some cases have traveled all the way up through the Earth. And, and it's neat to combine all these different things to try and learn about, well, it's the same process in every case. It's just the same process being triggered in a variety of different ways. Well, and we mentioned the, uh, you know, the Whipple Observatory and how it's like sitting out on the landscape and there's all these detectors. What do these water tank detectors look like? Um, they basically take an old mine underground, create a large spherical pool within it, line the walls of the sphere with photomultiplier tubes, fill the whole thing up, close the hatch, and hope you never have to go back inside because if you do, something broke. And, and so these are just basically giant tanks underground waiting quietly for something, for something to interact inside of them. And we did a whole show on neutrinos again and, and talked a bit more about those tanks, but you've got this same situation where you've got a neutrino passing through this medium, this water, and you're hoping that it's going to interact. And, and this is the, it, it's again that shrink of radiation it, that's what we're looking for. And, and so we, we have so many of these detectors just scattered all over the planet. We, we have, there's the Ice Cube Neutrino Observatory down in, in Antarctica. There's uh, Super Kamiokande in Japan. Uh, then we have the Air Observatory is also scattered about the planet. And one of the frustrating things at a certain level is with some of these things, uh, you're detecting events where the particles traveled all the way through the planet and so you can actually see the various detectors scattered through the world lighting up as these events take place and you can use the speed of light and the variation in time between when the different detectors light up to pinpoint vaguely where in the sky the event came from. I love the fact that you can put your detector on the opposite side of the Earth where the event happened and still detect it and still see the stuff, mm -hmm. you know, see the particles making their way through the Earth and catch them in your, in your, you know, you could... The you are annoying that way. Right, but you could have a, you know, you could have a, a planet Earth, you know, the size, like a light year across and, and still detect particles you know, because they'll go through like a light year's worth of lead. So N Neutrinos just don't like the electromagnetic force. They don't interact very strongly with anything. So, you know, our, our friend uh, Nicole, uh, the noisy astronomer, always says that, you know, she likes radio astronomy because you can go out and observe in the day and bad weather. It doesn't really matter. Right. I think neutrino observe, you know, observers have it take it to the next level. You know, you can observe. But, but they've had a, a whole new front. level of frustration at it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> So I'd like to go sort of talk about some of the big science. What are some of the big questions that astronomers have been working on? You know, and I think one is just this concept of cosmic rays and what's, what's causing them. Well, right. So cosmic rays is, is one of the issues of we, we know from taking uh, digital images that there are these random bright, explosions essentially in our images where five or six or more pixels will suddenly get completely saturated as well as a cosmic ray hits the detector and, and overloads those pixels on the detector. Uh, we know over time that detectors in space 
gradually get burnt out by getting hit over and over with these highly energetic particles. And so trying to understand where are these suckers coming from, um, that's, that's been a, a challenge that looking at this has allowed us to take on, looking at this has allowed us to pinpoint, well, these high energy places in our universe are accelerating particles, generally using magnetic fields. And that starts to tell us, you know, well, let's just accelerate more things with magnetic fields. And that starts to lead us to concepts like ion drives. Ion drives, one, uh, not entirely appropriate, but one reasonable an analogy to look at is an ion drive is just generating uh, cosmic rays flying out its rear end. And it's, it's the cosmic rays fly in one direction and the spacecraft accelerates in the other. But in the case of the cosmic rays that are hitting the atmosphere or these detectors, you're looking at something that has amounts of energy that baffle the imagination. I mean, they're giga electron volts. Right, right. You know. Yeah, nothing like a, a helium atom that has had its electrons stripped away, uh, hitting with, with enough energy to cause vast areas of the atmosphere to cascade with light. Um, and It's cool. And the challenge is, as you said, you know, these things are hitting the, the CCDs. They're going through the backside of the camera and smashing into the CCD. So it's really hard to get us fix yeah, yeah, where they're it, coming from. And, and not all cosmic rays come from space, just to be clear. One, one of the problems I ran into in graduate school observing at McDonald Observatory was the 30-inch telescope I was using. Its dome was sort of cut into the side of the mountain. And um, we, we, we had a radiation from granite issue going on. And, and so there is a high-energy background of cosmic rays being generated by radioactive decay processes right there underfoot. And so cosmic rays from space, cosmic rays from the ground, it's not the same energies, not the same origins, clearly, but equally annoying on the detector. And you really need to have, um, if everything's getting saturated, you have to keep building more and more sensitive to higher energies detectors to be able to start differentiating all these things that my little optical detector was getting blown out by. But I, but I really think that, I mean, this is one of the great advances with these Shrinkov detector arrays is that you finally can get a fix on these things. And so, I mean, you know, we don't want to ruin the story here. You, know, you should definitely go back and listen to our Cosmic Ray episode. But, but what turned out to be generating these particles is really neat. Right. So, so there's things like high-energy magnetic fields uh, with active galactic nuclei. So you have a black hole busily consuming material, and as it's busily consuming material, you end up with a disk spiraling around it because conservation of angular momentum prevents things from falling straight into a black hole, except under very specific special alignments that don't generally happen in reality. And this disk of spitting non-neutral material generates a very powerful magnetic field, and that magnetic field can um, basically act like an ion drive and fling particles at high velocities. We see these also coming from the disks around different stellar events, white dwarfs, stellar mass black holes, neutron stars, they can all have at varying degrees these different types of jets. Uh, we also see this coming out of supernovae, from hypernovae, from gamma ray bursts. Uh, our high energy universe is something that the previous generation of astronomers never really imagined. Yeah, we always note how um, if you ever watch Cosmos, you go back to watch Cosmos, and in, the, in the, like one of the first couple of episodes, Carl Sagan mentions that <clears throat> you know we've got these quasars, and we don't really know what they are. Right. Uh, you know, we think they might you know, offer us a few suggestions, but but now we know it is black holes with millions of times the mass of our sun, with these incredible warped up you know, uh, accretion disks around them with these huge magnetic fields. And that's what's capable of firing out these particles at such high and energy levels. This is very new knowledge. It, as recently as when I began graduate school, faculty were still drawing small monsters squatting in the centers of galaxies as the cause of AGNs. And it was only towards the end of when I was in graduate school, the beginning of this century, the beginning of the 2000s, that we fully had nailed down, yes, there are black holes in the centers of galaxies. 
but I, you know, and so I really love this this idea of being able to use. You can't look at the the phenomenon directly, but you can yeah. look at it by some other effect, you know, like a reflection yeah. or a an echo that tells you as much as you need to know or you can know about the original event. And I think this is a fantastic example of how scientists just get super yeah. clever about how you know we got to figure this out. Right. We can't look and at it directly, but maybe there's something else we can see. And, and unlike gamma ray telescopes on orbit or X-ray telescopes on orbit, using Shrenkov radiation, we can start to get at additional information because there is this cascade of particles that is getting created. There is this cascade of radiation that's getting created. And in, in some detectors, specifically the ones used in particle physics, uh, we're able to start getting at both the mass and the, the energy of, of what's creating the Shrenkov radiation. So it starts to get us actual information about the particles involved as well as, as the direction, the source, and the light involved. Well, thank you very much, Pamela. That was fantastic. So we'll see you uh, in a couple of days. We'll see you in a couple of days. All right. See you later. <laughs> Bye-bye.